we're talking about nogi grips. So now, this is what some people really favor about nogi, is that it's typically faster paced because we don't have the same ability to stall and slow people down. Yep. Now, we recommend both, and both uh, training gi and nogi can supplement each other for de developing defensive skills and developing offensive skills in different ways, but we need to learn how to control in nogi. Yep. And the great thing about nogi control is that we can use that while in the we're gi. wearing the key, because that yep. was something that I had several years of training before I trained with Rob, and I had no gi training primarily, and as I was transitioning to the gi, I was like, Rob, I don't know what the hell to do. Because for some reason in my head, I looked at the gi and I was like, everything I know doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. But that's not the case. You're just like, no, just roll like you would just no gi, and then you're gonna have to learn how to adjust to the grips that people make. And you, from that as well, you're gonna t pick up the knowledge of how to uh, grip and do that so, uh, effectively. So you can do this all the time. Yep. If someone's naked, which preferably is not the situation, or if somebody is fully clothed with like a gi, or even if we're looking at self-defense stuff uh, when someone's got a winter jacket, no gi stuff always works. Yeah. So, wrist control and elbow control. Same thing. Yep, Same we want to be at the end of the lever. So we're looking at the elbow point, we're looking here. The difference now is that our grips are gonna be significantly weaker and we're gonna have to be migrating further, faster with this or having better timing with stuff. We can grab at the wrist and you can do so with a C clamp here to grab on. The problem is that I don't have the complete end of the lever in the sense that controlling the hand is gonna allow me to affect the structure of the wrist and it's gonna afford me even more levers than it would with the gi. So I can get this grip and I do it all the time, but if Rob wants to start defending this, I can stall him only for a second. If I can get a grip here where I'm taking the palm of my hand, the meat of my thumb here, almost like the uh, keto wrist locks, only we're not really trying to do a wrist lock here. I'm just trying to get the end of the lever and I'm grabbing onto the big fat drumstick part of the thumb here with my hand. I'm able to get a very strong grip and that extra leverage will make it more difficult for Rob to escape. And it also really limits his option because my hand is covering over top of his thumb. If Rob was to try and come up towards the ceiling, that doesn't make sense. It's going to just drive in my hand. So he wants to circle out that way. That will eventually start leading me into other ways that I can now advance my movements because I've created that break in his alignment, or he's done it for me by defending that position. If we're looking at elbow control, once again, controlling here close to the elbow with a C grip here. I mean, uh, there's a lot of details of how we can really specifically control with like two on one control or have the best elbow control. But by being down by the elbow, I have better leverage. If I control mid tricep, I don't have very strong leverage. And we see how we can bring his elbow close to his body. I can get away with that stuff more in the gi because I'm able to create this bigger pull that can affect posture. But here, at the elbow, is gonna be much stronger. Some people like to grab up at the armpit for other purposes in the sense that I want to be actually affecting posture more than I would structure. That's gonna be depending on the soles. That's what we're doing at a distance. We, generally speaking, we're gonna start farther away from our opponent and we're gonna be trying to move closer. As a as a rough rule of thumb, I, I want to take away space offensively and defensively, I want to create space. So if I'm trying to attack Rory, you know, from out here, it's going to be really difficult. I'm going to want to start to bring myself closer and closer so that I can either expose his back or get to his neck or control his torso, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So starting with the wrists and the elbows, that's uh, like our sort of like distance gripping. And as we move closer, we will want either underhooks or overhooks. And hopefully those terms are pretty self-evident, but the underhook is where I'm bringing my arm underneath of my opponent's arm. And there are, are different ways to control it. Again, this isn't really the, the time or place for a highly technical explanation of these grips, but uh, generally speaking, there are three types of underhooks. I will want to have an underhook sort of at the shoulders. Uh, I will you know, have an underhook around the waist, and then I will have a, a low underhook around the butt or even below the butt. Of the three, the one around the waist is kind of the least useful because if Rory takes a strong overhook here, it really negates my ability to affect him well, and he can affect me quite well. If I take an overhook fairly high up by the shoulders and Rory, sorry, an underhook, and Rory takes an overhook, because Rory's shoulder is internally rotating, he's weak. We've created a, a, a compromised structure here where I can still affect him quite a bit and he can't really affect me. As I lower, that underhook. My elbow yeah. gets closer to its side, my shoulder gets into a nice comfortable position. I become much more athletic. And so now we see how alignment plays into the underhook game as well. And he can start to internally rotate my shoulder, thereby weakening my arm. 
So it, it's, there, there are ways to do this where I close my elbow, let's rotate a little bit. There are ways to do the underhook around the middle of the body where I close my elbow down and now he can't affect me as much, but I also can't affect him as much in this position. So this is the only one we don't recommend, although there are ways to make it work. You know, if you've got a lot of wrestling, if you're a strong guy, there's ways to make it work. But as a beginner, if you want your life to be easier, we want our underhooks fairly high or fairly low to negate the threat of the overhook. And then the flip side of that is if I'm having to use an overhook, I would prefer to have my elbow as close to my body as I can and to be driving my forearm up into Rory's armpit. So like if I'm playing a closed guard and I'm overhooking Rory, which this would be a really good idea because as far as Rory being able to be effective with the underhook against me, that doesn't really exist because I can keep the distance with my legs. Rory's underhook, like it doesn't threaten me. He can't affect my, my structure or my posture with the underhook, whereas I can affect his with my overhook. So that would be an example of where the overhook would be superior. Generally, you'll be told that the underhook is a superior form of control, and in a lot of circumstances it is, but in some circumstances, in particular guard and half guard, and even in some standing positions, which again, we're not gonna teach you how to wrestle, but you will see, particularly uh, on the international level, a lot of uh, nations, uh, the Iranians in particular, some of the Eastern Europeans, happen to favor overhooks for certain throws and things like that. So it's not as simple as just underhook good, overhook bad, or underhook good, overhook defensive kind of thing. Yeah. They both have their advantages. Uh, and as long as you understand them from the perspective of structure and controlling the internal rotation of the shoulder, which is basically this mechanism, as opposed to external rotation, which is another mechanism that you could create. For instance, if I'm overhooking Rory and I manage to do this, if you're like an old school MMA fan, Frank Mir, like broken dudes are like tap the guy certainly yeah. um, in a lock. fight with this, yeah, they call it the mirror lock. Uh, so any significant amount of extreme range, external or internal rotation will affect your opponent's structure significantly. And it's our job with underhooks and overhooks to create that effect so then we can generate some sort of offense. Absolutely, and so now if we take a look at the legs again, Similar thing, we're just using the C uh, grip. Some people like calling them Y grips because we have the form that kind of becomes the Y here because we don't want to be reinforcing our grips or lack of reinforcement. We're, we're kind of gripping and if Rob, like if my form is not lined up right behind my wrist and it's off to the side, if Rob kicks up, he's just going to access my hand as a lever. He accesses the fingers. It's very weak. But if I can stack the ulnar and the radial bone over top like this and create a strong frame where now my elbow is lined up with my form behind my wrist as well as my shoulder, now, even with that grip, I can make it quite difficult for Rob to hold. So I'm not holding a C grip like this, which is what we see beginners do all the time. There's that weak part of that grip. I need to cover that and I'm looking to compress Rob's legs down using more of my body weight, but I'm still not gonna be able to hold this control as long as I would in the gi. But this is gonna be a circumstance that you see a lot, even in competition, where because the gi pants rise so high, even if we're in the gi, I might want to try and use some gi grips, but there's going to be times where no gi grips are going to be better controlled than gi. So don't think that the gi is the only way or the best way. Because as I said, this would be now just in the middle of the shin. Crap. Here. Now. Crap. Can. So maybe mixing up the controls where I'll use kind of a hybrid of no gi and gi grips. Where here, okay, I'm going to get a nice good gi grip on the inside of his knee. I'm going to get a nice grip down here on his ankle. So now as Rob starts trying to move, I'm able to keep really tight control and I'm going to be able to start setting up passes. In the same sense that the underhook, we see the underhook, gi and no gi, because it's such a dominant control, uh, direct rotational control, chest to chest connection, that we'll see people use grips on the gi, get past, and then start moving into the underhooks. And they might try and grab up behind it, like the collar, to be able to supplement that control even further, because as we said, when someone can grip the gi, they anchor and it becomes very difficult to take that control away from them. So don't think that gi is the only thing. Like that's the yeah. most frustrating stuff, stuff for us uh, when we see with beginners is that you think that gi is the only way that you can control your opponent and then as soon as someone goes no gi, you're just, you've lost, lost all the yeah. tools that you had. So. Okay, jumping ahead a few days here because we completely <laughs> forgot about the collar tie. <laughs> one of the most important grips in no gi, but we kind of got sidetracked going down the other tangents here. So the collar tie you'll see in gi and no gi. Collar tie is when Rob has a grip here on my neck and framing along my collarbone here. 
there is the frame, the humerus bone here from his elbow to his shoulder as a frame managing the distance to stop me from being able to get close to him. And this gives him the ability to control posture. So you're going to see different kinds of uh, collar tie of, depending on whether they're grabbing kind of at the neck, which is totally fine because this obviously still gives a frame and still controls the back of my head. So it's hard for me to pull away, but it's going to be more difficult for Rob to access my spine as a lever because you can see how gargantuan my head is. Rob's grabbing more at the base, but if he comes up from the, the back of my skull, now if I try to keep my neck straight and he curls me down, it's very difficult for me to fight. So either style can be used, but yeah. it's going to be kind of dependent on the goals as always. I I tend to, like, yeah, I mean, it's not wrong to use it at the base of the neck, I would say, but you, you're you going to have some liabilities. I, I, I don't teach it that way. I, I think uh, that having the elbow placement a little bit higher and the hand higher on the head creates a better frame. Because even if we're talking about the framing potential of just my uh, my humerus, if it's down here, yes. I'm f my frame is now in the middle of Rory's chest and it's much easier for Rory to start to turn his shoulder and access it as a lever. Whereas when it's up here, Rory starts to turn his shoulder, it's nowhere near the problem that it would be otherwise. So and there's a part that's probably hard to see here. Rob is opening up his elbow a little bit out towards my shoulder. He is not having this drift straight down the middle. Because even if he has good, uh, Positioning with his hand here, his elbows, elbows right spot. Yeah. This becomes that alignment battle again, where if Rob just a little bit of internal rotation just to get in position here. Oh, very strong, very strong control. Yeah, so it's super common uh, when you're playing butterfly guard, and obviously in like standing positions where it'll become uh, yeah, a wrestling. Just, type just thing. don't club the uh, <laughs> your partner's side of the head all over and over again. You'll see this at higher level competitions and wrestling matches where they're basically striking each other. Yeah, you can grab very aggressively, but make sure it doesn't turn into an actual impact. So let's talk a little bit now about uh, upper body control uh, as opposed to controlling the limbs. So uh, let's say, I, like, we're not gonna do the standing, but uh, I could do a body lock around Rory. If we're in a passing position, Rory's on his back, I could use that same sort of body lock to get past his guard. If I'm behind him, I can utilize, uh, we usually call it a seat belt grip, which is like an over under style grip where I'm connecting my hands and I'll talk in a second about the different ways that I'll be connecting my hands. But basically I can either go completely around the, the waist below the uh, armpits or I can go one arm below the armpit and one arm above the armpit. And that would be the same if we were facing each other. Like if we were in a more of a standing position, you know, I've got an underhook and an overhook. He's got an underhook and an overhook or I could even connect my hands, one over his arm, one under his arm, and connect my hands behind his back. So I'm either going directly around the waist to some degree, or I'm going over one or the other shoulder, and I can supplement those with some of the uh, like arm grips. So I can, what we call this a, a motorcycle grip. It's like, you know, revving motors, we can go double motorcycle grip. I can use my thumbs or not my thumbs, depending on what I'm trying to achieve. I can move to Kimura style grips, which are, again, internal rotation mechanism lever control to the shoulder, which allows me to turn him. This is probably the most powerful upper body grip that you can uh, get in Nogi, uh, you know, like assuming that you don't like, you know, have the back and all the other kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, those are the grips uh, that we'll use. We'll also use head and arm grips. So if, if I get you on your back, um, on my back. back yeah. so we'll use head and arm grips, which are kind of like the opposite of the seat belt from the back. I'm, I'm going, I'm going over, one shoulder and under one armpit, and I'm using this as a connection point, getting myself with that square chest to chest sort of position, and this allows me access again through the underhook to some different attacks, uh, arm triangles, things like that. Uh, and then we've got front headlock style grips, which is again the same thing, it's one arm going through the armpit and one arm going over the shoulder. So th these are all variations of the same seat belt style grip, they're just changed based on my relative body position. So one arm over, one arm under. There are different ways to control the front headlock, but just to keep it simple, we're connecting our hands like so. And again, you know, maybe in a future video, we can go over the details of the front headlock and how that allows us to attack guillotines and things like that. As far as how we're connecting our hands, we will either be making what's called a gable grip, not a cable grip. After I'll put that at the bottom. Yeah, <laughs> uh, after Dan Gable, uh, I believe University of Iowa wrestler, which is a no thumb grip where we're just grabbing, again, that drumstick meat of the thumb part and then grabbing the bottom of my hand like this. So that's one form. That thumbless part's really important because it allows us to get a deeper grip and have our fingers wrap over more because I used to do this with the thumb. But think, like, try and do this with the, with the thumb 
and then try and keep your hands at the exact same position, bring the thumbs over, and now wrap that same gable grip. Look how shallow these fingers end up trying to wrap over top because once I've incorporated the thumb joint, it pushes my hand further down my fingers. Here, we can almost get wrist to wrist a very strong grip. Yeah, and no then you, thumb. you'll get also a slight variation of that, which is the butterfly grip where you're just grabbing your uh, radial bone and your ulnar bone like this. As a taller person, I typically grab you here will, every yeah, time because you can, I want to create a uh, smaller circumference of this circle to be able to tighten up around my opponent and that yeah. once again going to be depending on the goals that you're trying some to accomplish. Some people will even grab their own elbows if you've got really really long yeah. arms that's a possibility. Uh, other grips we'll use will be an S grip for the, so short people. For the shorter people or if you're dealing with somebody who's quite girthy. Uh, shout out to my American friends. <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, <laughs> so uh, uh, this allows me to reach again a, a wider circumference. And then we've got a couple of slight variations, uh, something called a three finger grip, which allows us to maintain a fair bit of control around our wrist while still rotating our elbow. This will be specific to certain attacks that you may or may not get into uh, you know, in, in the beginning of your journey. So you can probably ignore this one for now, but basically we've got our gable grip, we've got our butterfly grip, variations of it, and then we've got our S grip. And so at a lower level, and a kind of an interesting note, because it wasn't until quite late until my uh, into my development where you pointed out where there was a lot of times where I would use grips like this, where I would just make say like a monkey grip, hook grip over top of the forearm. Same like if I was defending an arm bar. There are gonna be times where this is absolutely gonna be effective, yeah. but there is the issue in the sense that I only actually have one hand engaged in the grip. If I have this arm as a fist, this hand is a fist and this hooks over, only my left hand is actually engaged in that uh, grip rather than using both. Where if I S gripped together or if I gable gripped, I now have the power of two hands. And so in a circumstance like say like armbar defense, this is something I did a lot. I would grip over top only like this. And now my right arm isn't actually doing anything. One, Rob could potentially access it as lever or it's just my left hand getting tired. Or even just making sure I'm gable gripping, still keeping the hand on bottom. I now have both my hands engaged and I can be stronger and I can be more effective. So you can absolutely create grips by creating those closed circuits by still gripping over top of like the forearm. Sometimes when shit hits the fan, you're going to have to just get straight into Quite the Quite commonly grip. on the back uh, and some of the more dominant positions, this is the grip that we'll be using. We'll be covering one hand. Uh, a lot of times that'll be because Rory is actually going to be blocking and supporting my hand. So the, I, I don't really need to add any kind of additional friction. And I have so many limited options here. And then you also might entice me to want to try and push that off. So that I can attack. So this is a, a very good grip. When we do a guillotine, We'll be using this kind of grip. The, the grip over the back of the hand like this tends to be an offensive grip to set up chokes where we're, we're, we're utilizing one hand to assist uh, and the other hand to choke. So I'll have a choking arm and I'll have an assisting arm, whether that's in the form of a guillotine or in the form of a rear naked choke. This is most commonly where you'll see the, the palm gripping the back of the hand. That's a very uh, like legitimate style of gripping, but if I'm trying to like hold somebody who's resisting me and pulling away from me. Uh, the reason we can do this from the back as well is because uh, generally speaking, I will have my legs keeping Rory from running away from me. So this is not so much a grip to hold him in place versus full resistance. It's more just to attach me to him and create opportunities for hand fighting. So it's, it's totally fine that I'm not optimizing my like isometric grip strength here because it's not my goal to hold you in place with just my arms. That's just the, the reasoning behind the, the different grips. So we've given you guys kind of an idea, uh, an overview of the grips, maybe even a little more in depth than we were planning, but it's really important stuff. And so now we're gonna go over how, uh, some ideas on how to break those grips so that you're not just getting shut down when you're trying to grapple.